Attention listeners, AfterSight's annual hike is coming up on July 27th. It was a really good experience for me. Visit AfterSight.org slash hike and become an audio trekker today. That hike today gave me so much courage. Welcome to Blind Level Tech. I'm Jonathan Price. I'm Evan Starnes. And together, we're bringing you news, tech, and information about blind technologies. Being blind doesn't mean you have to stop living. We're going to show you just how possible it is to live the life you want. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Blind Level Tech. Hope you guys are enjoying the beautiful month of... uh, well, it's probably going to be June, actually, now as as we're recording this. But I am your host, Evan Starnes, joined by the one, the only, Kelvin Crosby. Hey, 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 hey. so good to see you, even though I can't see you. It's another beautiful day in the neighborhood, and I'm so excited that you are here. And I tell you, we got a cool guest today. We're I, we're going to do our best not to be way too nerdy here today. But I tell you, it's going to be amazing. And I tell you, we're talking 3D printing. We're talking 3D printers, and we're talking some new ways to look at uh, two-dimension art to actual 3D uh, images that you can actually feel visually impaired. So, Evan, tell us all about our guest today. Well, yes, actually, and we're going to be talking about some um, some cool, like older stuff too. But this um, this is Ted Tequichi. He's got an incredible tech journey. I'm not sure if um, if he's been on the blind shake yet or not. Um, but he I actually, just was. Oh, you were great. Yeah. So I'm not entirely sure when that episode drops, but um, dude's got a heck of a vision loss story. So uh, definitely go and check that out when it drops. And yeah, Ted, welcome to Blind Level Tech. How are you doing today? Thanks for having me. So Ted, so tell us a little bit about your story and when did you become visual impaired? What's your visual impairment? And then how did you get in the tech world? I started in the tech world out of uh, college. I was a radio, I was a DJ for many years. I had a, a drive time radio show in the San Francisco Bay Area and um, <clears throat> I was lured away from the disc jockey lifestyle and moved into the video games. Um, I was offered a, a tester job, you know, just come and hang out and play games and have a good time uh, and get paid for it. So um, I started with Atari in uh, Sunnyvale, California. And, um, you know, just it, it was obviously just living the dream, you know, and uh, just playing the games and, and writing up bug reports and that good stuff. And uh, just kind of worked my way up through the... Uh, the corporate ladder there and started becoming an associate product manager or a producer as they called it at Atari. And, uh, then eventually moved up to the senior producer role, um, where I was overseeing other producers and making games myself. I worked on, uh, games for most of the Atari platforms. The, I have a couple 2600 games, uh, 7,800, 5,200, <clears throat> um, Falcon ST, um, the links, Jaguar, Lynx, nice. I mean, yeah, and PC, a couple PC titles for Atari as well. And uh, I was with them until they closed their doors. And then we moved to uh, Accolade um, there in San Jose. And uh, there I created the Test Drive Off-Road franchise. Um, and I was there for a while until I moved to Michelle, or Michelle, Mattel Toys, and uh, <clears throat> worked for their uh, Hot Wheels division. I was in charge of all of the games uh, for the Hot Wheels uh, property. And at the height of my video game career, we got into a car accident, and everything that was in that everything kind of shifted in my vision where to where it was not supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so I lost. Um, most of the vision in my right eye, it's like 95% gone and, and all of the vision in my left eye is gone. Mm. Uh, so yeah, so it's, <clears throat> it's, it's been an interesting ride as far as that goes. Yeah. So, uh, kind of moving and in, in, into doing other things and, and, uh, out of the tech industry. So did you have a brain injury at that point coming I mean, or just a vision loss issue? 
No, no brain injury. And, uh, it was optic nerve uh-huh. and retinal detachment and, um, retinal shift, which is very strange. Yeah. So it's, it's, a uh, I don't know, there's all kinds of different stuff going on, but basically they, they went in there and <clears throat> they kind of tied everything back together with duct tape and bailing wire. And it's, you know, you know, knock on wood, it's, it's, it's got 5%. Um, I can see blurry shapes and, um, I do have really good acuity for light value, which is how I get to be a photographer. So absolutely. That that, that is fascinating. Yeah. So Evan, why why don't we look into that a little bit? Yeah. Cause Ted, you, um, you kind of jump ship basically, and literally in some cases from video game testing and design to travel and photography. So how did you actually get started with travel and photography in the very first place? Yeah, I run the uh, blindtravels.com website and uh, I've run that for since like 2013 or some or 2014 or something like that. And um, basically, uh, I've always had a love of travel. When I worked in the games industry, um, we would or I, I would be working externally most times because there's there's usually two teams. There's internal teams and, and external teams, and I was on um, external. So I had several different um, developer groups working for me in different areas of the world. Um, so I spent most of the time, you know, three weeks out of every month, I was either in, in London or, you know, somewhere else in the UK, uh, France, Germany, or... Uh, very seldom here in the U S um, and, you know, kind of just gave me the travel bug. And after the accident, I kind of had a, a compendium of information that I kept about the hotels that we went to about like where the check-in desk was and the, the pool is located and all of the, the other hotel amenities, like the restaurant and that sort of thing. Um, so, and I, and I would just keep this, this database of information and then that, uh, originally transferred to being blind travels, which was a, a kind of a, a website for me, um, just so that when I went to some place that I had already been to, that I could look at that and, and reference it. And then it kind of grew, you know, and, and kind of went crazy. And, and that trans- transitioned into uh, doing a lot of the travel photography stuff. Um, after the accident, I went back to school and, you know, some something about visual art just drew me into doing that. So, um, you know, pursuing a a degree in visual art when you're almost completely blind is sometimes nothing short of madness, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I can't imagine that's kind of where I ended up. So, I mean, it's really interesting. You talk about that because I mean, I mean, if if people don't know, I'm also known as a deafblind potter. And Uh, I mean, it mm -hmm. truly is something that it's one of the main reasons why I got into pottery. It could, I could, I could three D mold and shape <laughs> my pottery. But before Absolutely. that, I was a, I was a painter, and man, I love painting. And I would, I would make it somewhat tactile so I could touch it and interact with the paint. Um, I, it made, me, it made a mess of me, but it, it was, mm-hmm. so, it, it was something. And but yeah, I, truly, the art form is quite incredible and i mean did you find and for me at the, at the deafblind potter like clay was my healing mechanism to help me work through my deafblindness when i became deafblind did you find that as you were going to college and starting learning this new medium for yourself very much so uh, we have twin boys mm-hmm. uh and they're they're 26 now but you know, during that time, they were like five years old, and this was in, in 2000. And um, I was, I mean, I'm sure you've heard the stories a million times where, you know, the the person that loses his sight is totally resistant to, you know, orientation and mobility because I can see well enough, mm. you know, and mm-hmm. didn't want to use my white cane and, and uh, wasn't going to sign up for a guide dog and, you know, all of these things, even though I well qualified for, for all of it, you know, and more. Um, but you know, I, I was missing things around me Mm -hmm. and I had done some photography when I was in college in the eighties and, uh, you know, kind of like did my, my dues in the, in the dark room and that sort of stuff. But, um, I, I ended up picking up the digital camera and kind of traveling around and and having it around my neck all the time Mm and kind of capturing the things that I, that I couldn't see because I couldn't, you know, I didn't have any distance vision, you know, everything was super blurry. So 
I would, I would take the camera, take the picture, bring it home and then, you know, see the things that I was missing on the computer screen afterwards. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And another thing that you seem to pick up, um, besides the, the lovely digital camera is actually a really cool form of tactile or art. That's, um, a pretty modern innovation and that would be 3d printing. So, um, as much as you can tell us, can you kind of um, tell us a little bit about this uh, this business that you've got going um, that makes images into tactile three D prints? Certainly, yeah. Um, late last year, uh, we started a partnership with uh, Redline Contemporary Art Center here in Denver and uh, the Andy Warhol Foundation uh, for Visual Art. And um, w- what we are doing is uh, we're working on a body of a body of work which I would probably should to talk a little bit about the body of work. Um, when I was in school originally, I put together a collection of, of um, portraiture that was abstract visions of the human body. Wow. So orig- originally I had been tasked as one of the um, assignments in the photo class to do classic portraiture. And she said, make sure that, that you, you know, the teacher said, make sure that you have, you know, either a smiling face or a serious face and, you know, make sure that you have, you know, light in the eyes and all these other things. And I'm like, Oh, I can't see any of that. You know, how am I going to do that? Um, so I talked with the teacher and said, can I do something else? You know, can I look at another way of doing portraiture? Um, so we went back and forth and and we ended up on doing hands. So I was looking at doing, you know, pictures of praying hands and playing hands and working hands and all these these different things, but lighting it from a, you know, classic portraiture mm-hmm. style. And um, then it just kind of progressed from there. I started, you know, doing a little bit more of like the body and the arms and that sort of stuff. And then it moved into doing full nudes, which is you know, very interesting because it doesn't have any of the naughty bits, you know, it's, it's all, you know, safe for work, you know, hey, it's not explicit. I, 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 when I started learning about it, I'm like, Hmm, where, where are we going on there? Right. I mean, do we need to go well, to, especially, a, especially to a, if I'm making tactile prints, I'm not going to make boobs and stuff that you can touch. Oh, I mean, sorry. do we need to go to an that's, adult that's website? The <laughs> um, but anyway, so, so it, I ended up doing these, these kind of very low light, um, pictures so that, you know, we work in a, in a very dark environment. Um, and then I shoot, you know, um, very close to the model and kind of, we're getting little bits of like arm and, and sometimes parts of the neck and we're lighting it kind of on the edge and that sort of thing. So, um, the body of, of work is like super inclusive. So it includes people, um, participants who are, um, male, female, and several other genders. And we have people who range in age from 19 to 76. Um, we have grandmothers, we have, you know, uh, young, young people and, um, boy, it's, it's, you know, plus size to, um, size zero. Um, it's just, it's really amazing. We have people who are, uh, mobility impaired wheelchair users, and uh, it's just, you know, it, it tries to kind of touch on everybody and everything. Yeah. And it, so it was like really inclusive, but not inclusive for people who are visually impaired. Exactly. Right. And that was the that was kind of the big thing is making it accessible. And how are we going to do that? Mm-hmm. And we started originally with a company here in Colorado called Duraplac. And what oh, they yeah. would do is have, are you guys familiar with them? I'm not. This is the first time. But gotcha. So they have a they have a an embossing uh, style of of photo that you, that they do on uh, metal, oh, and wow. they layer ink like like you would in a regular you know tactile print or a paint or whatever, um, and then they put a clear coat over it so it's so it's touchable if you want to. So we worked with them you know and kind of finessed that style um, and kind of brought it to the next level for them so that if we could make some some tactile prints. Um, and that's what kind of led us into working with the Lighthouse for the Blind. And we've had a um, several year solo exhibition uh, there uh, with that body of work, which is really cool. It's been in their lobby and, and people have been able to see it and people can touch the prints and stuff. But the problem is, is that those prints are really expensive to make. Yeah. And there's no way to have the body of work in more than one location at a time because it costs so much yeah. money to have the prints made. So that's what we were looking at with the with Redline and with the Warhol Foundation was taking things to the next level 
with 3D printing so that we could actually have the ability to iterate the tactile prints rather than having somebody else do it. So it kind of, it kind of put it all back into my, into my court as an artist, yeah. right? Instead of having yeah. somebody else do the print, then I was able to do it myself. And, I mean, um, so late last year we started and long, you know, super long story. Sorry. No, no, um, no, you're good. Uh, so, so late last year we, we started with them and, um, they purchased some, some 3d printers for us and, and uh, a bunch of other stuff, which was really great. And uh, just kind of threw us into the deep end and said, you know, good luck. You know, hopefully you can do something that nobody else is doing. <laughs> yep, yep. Well, what's interesting is in the 3D printing world, and uh, again, 3D printing for visually impaired is, is a pain in the rear end. Let's just be straight. Um, yes, it is. And I mean, I, I've always used Tinkercad for my uh, CAD and software um, because I yep. can just code everything from the browser. Um, yep. And so it works great. It does the simple things. It doesn't, it's not great, but it does the job. I mean, and yep. you can program JAWS and also NVDA to get the different parts to the, uh, to the, get your numbers in there and all that stuff. So, um, oh, yeah. And so, Evan, have you ever used any 3D printing software before? I so I had the opportunity to, but it wasn't accessible. It was op- I think it was called OpenCAD back yep. in high school, and I I had always just seen the three D printer we'd had, the MakerBot Replicator Five, was a very menu driven th- machine. As in, you spin this little wheel around, around, hit it to select options. It wasn't super accessible, so I I kind of was just like, okay, uh, maybe yeah. this will be accessible one day, but I don't know how to make it accessible. <laughs> So I, well, and I, and I think that that printers at those at that time were basically um, you receiving a box of stuff and you had to put it all together. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. yeah. I mean, and let's talk about your three D printer. I mean, you you guys are using uh, bamboos, and th- those are some sweet printers right there, man. Um, I mean, I have raised three Ds and Persos, but um, tell us a little bit what kind of made you guys go into the bamboo route. So I did, you know, w- with everything I do, doesn't matter whether it's, you know, traveling to a new location or whether it's buying a piece of equipment, I do exhaustive, painful research and comparisons. I talk with people that that are in the industry. Um, I got into contact with, in, in the particular 3D, 3D printing uh, realm, a whole bunch of people that that were making software and stuff like that and, and you know, kind of went for the, okay, what's your dream printer? You know, what is it that, that you would that you would get if you could buy one today um, and money was not an object. And, and without question, um, the X1 Carbon from Bamboo Labs with the AMS, the, the um, uh, automatic material system is, yep. was the one. Um, and, and that was because of the slicer stuff. The bamboo slicer is really good, yep. but it also just works. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of why we headed in that direction. Um, the problem with bamboo is that they're, they're not super responsive about, technical support. Yep. So kind of learning a new technology for me, um, cause I hadn't done much 3d printing, uh, was a little bit difficult and I had to, to outsource it to a lot of people that, that I know that are, you know, have been tinkerers and doing 3d CAD mm-hmm. or 3d, uh, printing for a long time. Uh, so, you know, it's, it was definitely thrown into the deep end as far as that goes. Yeah. It, it, too bad we're just meeting now. I would introduce you to the race 3d. They got an amazing tech support team there. Um, gotcha. but, um, but you're in bamboo world and you might as well stay. Cause it's a good product. And uh-huh. it is. Yeah. So I think we, we can go really deep into the 3d printing. What film are you guys using? Cause I mean, obviously you're going to need to give details. So PLA is okay for that, but you're going to need a little bit more fine tuning. So what kind of filaments are you guys using? Most of the stuff I do all of my iterations in PLA. Um, I can talk a little bit about the process. So, so I think the, you know, kind of taking a step back once, you know, that I didn't really talk about what we're doing with the actual 3d printers. So, um, you know, once we have the pictures in hand, um, then we're we're taking and, and going through. If you just if you throw them into like a lithophane maker or something like that, and then just dump them to a uh, to a three D printer, the problem is is that you're going to get some tactile feel out of it, but mm-hmm. you're not going to have uh, as much in the way of subject matter separation from background and that and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, 
So what we do is we, we take them and we throw them into Photoshop and we do a whole bunch of Photoshop voodoo and output a file that works with the 3D. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hesitating because there's, there's some things that I can and can't talk about. Right. Um, so, um, so we're outputting the, the files, but what it allows us to do basically is to run and run Photoshop texture um, extractor mm. and then gives us four different distinct layers of texture on the 3d print. Yeah. Um, which is, which is really cool. So that allows, if you're taking a picture of a mountain or whatever, then you can, you can select the mountain because, you know, Photoshop's got some really wonderful subject selection tools now with all their AI, you know, yeah. stuff going on. Um, and then you can, you can select that out and, and set it as a specific layer that's going to print as, as high as you want it to be, you know, you can do up to like a five millimeter print if you want um, to get like ludicrous level of texture, um, or you can do it more kind of, you know, fine art and, and do it in the like two and a half to three millimeter range. Yeah. Um, and then that's kind of the way that, that we're approaching it. So absolutely, we're, we're taking this, this bodies, these, these bodies, abstract body pictures, and we're throwing it through Photoshop nightmare and then sending it to bamboo lab and, and all the iteration stuff is being done with PLA. Um, but for the most part with the, with the texture extractors that we're doing, we're, we're able to stay with that. Okay. Um, so that's that's you know to answer your your question in a very long way, <laughs> we're, we're we're staying with PLA because they're they're it's a it's a cheap filament. Yep. Uh, we're using bamboo filament, uh, bamboo PLA, and because um, we're not really worried about you know super uh, longevity because they're easy to reprint. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm Evan. I, I think one of the things that when you experience. Uh, tactile art do you find that if it's too detailed it's difficult to feel oh yeah it's staticky yeah it's overwhelming it's like a sensory it is. overload in fact it kind of brings me back to and I, maybe you i don't know uh, ted if you might have had to deal with this in college but those tactile maps in those in the big textbooks uh yep. i remember taking u.s history and they tried to have me decipher those and i i just i couldn't it was too much I completely agree, and I and that really was one of the big or one of the big concerns with me when we started this project was that, like I said, it it feels very much like static to me. So when I'm when I'm touching something and there's n there's just too much detail and and not enough separation between the objects within the print, um, then it's it's really just you know overwhelming, and you want it to be accessible to kind of every level of viewer. Um, and, and I, we've kind of taken a fine art photography approach to it where you're, you're basically pushing and pulling the things that are important in your image mm -hmm. farther or closer to you in the composition, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. That makes yep. sense. Well, I mean, I think what's really interesting is, so for those, I'm going to do a shameless plug here, but for the month of June, Deafblind Potter is going to be doing a tactile experience through art. And so nice. if you want to watch oh, yeah. my, my experiences with picking up random pieces of art and feeling it um, and telling me what I think, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Deafblind Potter is going to be doing that on Instagram and TikTok. And, but nice. what's interesting okay. is why I asked this question is because it's truly when I was building maps and so forth for the visually impaired um, right before COVID, this was something that was a major issue is getting the detail that you need and also make it visually appealing. And I'm yep. curious, uh, Ted, are you really, how are you guys just kind of working out those different color situations for people like low vision and that, can want that tactile experience, but also can kind of take out that color situation. Yeah. So uh, we're, we're actually doing, we're separating church and state so much. <laughs> what we're doing is when, when we, um, when we exhibit a piece, when a piece is shown, we do the traditional print. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's like a, just a standard traditional 11 by 14 print uh, in a frame. And then uh, alongside, we actually have the tactile print uh -huh. and we've made a little um, like holder for it that we can, you know, use a little command strip and, and stick it on the wall next to it. But so you can actually take the, the tactile print out if, if the, um, 
uh, if the establishment is is cool with that, so that you can actually spend time with it and 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 feel all of the parts. But along with that, the problem is is that you you don't have a lot of context when you're just touching something if mm-hmm. you're not told what it is. Yeah. Uh, so we have tactile QR codes. Mm-hmm. So that we've made with RFID tags, so you can either just scan it with your phone, and we use tactile so that you can tell where to print, where to to put your camera, because that's one of the biggest things. QR codes are great, but if you can't tell where to, yep. to like put your camera, then <laughs> you exactly. know, it's not much help. <laughs> They're completely inaccessible otherwise. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So with that and the RFID tag, then, then they're, they're pretty accessible. And so what that does is that triggers a, an, a full audio description of the experience that you're going to have when you, when you're uh, looking at it, uh, when you're looking at the tactile print. Yeah. Wow. So that's when- incredible. I mean, I'm I'm definitely interested. In this kind of where when are you guys bringing this really to market? Like, are you guys doing beta testing, or where 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 are we at with this? We've been working with the uh, National Federation of the Blind, the um, the Boulder uh, group, and uh, a bunch of other people that I know that are blind. Uh, we've been working with them, and uh, we're the first time we're going to show it is going to be at the National Federation for the Blind, their national conference in okay. Florida, which is really cool. Well, I'll see you there. I'm super excited about that. <laughs> And then uh, it's going to be here in Colorado, and we're going to be showing it at the uh, National Federation for the Blind, the state Colorado State Convention. Mm-hmm. I think it's in Lakewood, if I remember. Yep, right. Yeah, Lakewood. Yep. Yeah. And the doctor. Hey, and the doctor. Over. Right. Nice. Yeah. yeah it's it's doctor. always on Halloween. Yeah. And uh, we're also going to be showing it at the Shine Music Festival in August. So that's August 24th. Oh, sweet. You're going to be at the Shine Music Festival. We'll be there as well. After Sight's going to be um, attending that. So that'll be that'll Excellent. be awesome. Yeah, and I'm going to be, I guess, on the the Blind Chick uh, podcast there as well. So heck yeah, absolutely. It should be fun. It should be lots of fun. Absolutely. Well, one thing that is also really fun is actually not even close to, not even closely related to photography or 3D printing. In fact, it's not even technological, but it is. The sandwich of the week. I'm actually gonna I'm gonna go first because I have a really boring sandwich, and. Uh, well, let's just say I was at uh, um, I was at Subway this week. Uh, well, last weekend, and I, I wanted a quick fix, and uh, I ended up ordering a, a tuna sub. And I know a lot of people don't like tuna, but I love it. And uh, that was one of the very few times I could eat an entire foot long in one sitting. But um, yeah, Kelvin, you got a sandwich of the week for us. Well, mine is I, I'm calling this the Kelvinator sandwich. And that is, oh, uh, yes. uh, it is tuna with some jalapeno with mayonnaise and pepper jack cheese on some pepper jack bread. Yeah. Oh. And not pepper jack it's bread, but, but a jalapeno pumpernickel, bread. Oh, jalapeno bread. Yeah. yeah pumpernickel's tiny. So, Ted, what is your sandwich for the week? Oh, my goodness. Probably um, shout out to the guys at Crave Burgers in um, Castle Rock. Have you guys been there? <laughs> No, but it's a place I will be adding to my list. It, it is it is worth the pilgrimage if you're up here up north. Um, they have a burger called the Campfire uh, that is an absolute favorite of mine. It's got a raspberry barbecue sauce on it. Wow. Uh, it comes with uh, deep fried jalapeno uh, bottle caps on it. Oh, wow. Uh, it's got uh, fried onions that are dusted in coffee. And uh, wow. it has pepper jack cheese and it's a bison patty. So, yeah, oh, no question. Yes. That's my favorite burger. Bison is such the way to go. One of my favorites, yes. too. I will be checking that out. Well, yes, well worth it. Absolutely. Well, Ted, there's one little question that we actually meant to ask at the beginning. We kind of forgot it. Um, but uh, we've we've kind of added a new thing to our format uh, since it's BLT, where we, we like to ask you know, people, what their favorite tech product is. It can be AT or just, uh, you know, whatever standard consumer tech, um, just because you might, you might find a new device or, you know, it's, 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 it's fun to talk tech. So, uh, Ted, what would, what is your like current favorite piece of technology? I, I will absolutely answer that, but I'm also going to throw a question back at you, and oh, I'm going to yeah. say, and, and, and I'll give you a minute to think while I blah blah about what my favorite tech is. Um, and and the question to you is, what is it about tech that drives you insane? Oh, okay. that's oh my goodness, <laughs> so, that's a loaded one. <laughs> so uh my my favorite tech is is old school. I'm really I really love audiobooks, and and I love the fact that. Um, 
the written word can be presented in a different way. And I think that 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 kind of has been my whole like methodology for, for life and art and everything else is that just finding a different way. So just, you know, the way that I do photography, it's, it's not traditional and it's, and it's, you know, definitely from a, from a blind person's standpoint, but you know, Hey, it's, it's a different way. And, and so, you know, anything that has to do with, um, allowing me to kind of move into doing, um, experiencing a really cool, um, audio book is something that I love. Uh, there's a bunch of guys called uh, sound booth theater, if I remember correctly, oh, yeah. and they do lit RPG stuff. So if you like games, then they do a whole bunch of different books on, um, different, like, you know, talking about journeys through dungeons and that kind of stuff. And it really is just a lot of fun to read, to listen to their stories. Absolutely. No, that's really cool. And uh, trust me, we'll, we'll get to your question here in a bit, but um, I'll say for this week, my, my piece of tech is nothing super fancy at all. But a couple weeks ago, uh, I got a new mechanical gaming keyboard from a friend. And uh, before that, I'd had the Razer, Razer Black Widow Ultimate, um, and it had the Cherry MX, I think they're the MX Blue switches, but really loud, clacky, you know, it's a proper clacking box, but not the most ideal thing if I'm on like a Zoom call or if I'm trying to record a podcast. So this one has much quieter switches and a nice little, like, it has this cool little magnetic wrist rest. It's also a Razer. And um, I, I've, been, I've been loving the heck out of that thing. But Kelvin, you got a piece of tech? Yeah, so I got some uh, smart glasses. So they're they're some fr- they're from Razer, and so basically what you do is you put them on, you connect them to your phone, and then they're essentially earbuds that are not on your ear but on your glasses, and they it's all quiet. It's like they're the little speaker on the sides, and then they're like right now like they're fifty bucks, and they're normally two hundred wow. two hundred and thirty bucks. So, um. So yeah, they're a good buy right now on Amazon, and they, they have good sound quality. If you can hear, for me, I was trying to work with it for my hearing aids. It didn't work that great. So if you're a hearing aid user, it's not a, ideal. But for people that can hear well, I tell you, it's pretty awesome. Um, my wife tried it, and a couple other people have tried it, and they're like, "This sounds amazing." And there's nothing in my ears, and so yeah. if if the um, what do you call it? What is the uh, the aftershocks don't work for you or the bone conductive? Bone con- bone but you want yeah. to have a no, non hearing or non plug or headphones on. Um, the radio glasses on Amazon, we got a way to go. Absolutely. Nice. Well, Ted, it has been a bit. Uh, it's been really fun having you on BLT today. Uh, really Thank hope. You. Um, really hope you enjoyed sitting and chatting with us for a bit. Um, is there anything you would like our audience to walk away with um, from this episode in particular? Uh, feel free to follow me on social media. Um, probably the best way would be at Instagram at Nedsky, N-E-D-S-K-E-E. Uh, you can see more about the, uh, learn more about the work that I was talking about that's called Landscapes of the Body. And the website is bodyscapes.photography. Um, and then you can also see um, kind of the hub of all of my online stuff is just my last name, dot com. Very, very good. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming back every single week and listening to BLT with us. And just as a reminder, our After Sight Audio Trekkers hike is coming up. In a month. In, in, yeah, just about a month. July 27th. And if you want to register for that bad boy, you want to go to aftersight.org slash hike. Additionally, if you got any feedback for our podcast hosts and or just any questions for um, for our podcast, we actually did get one that we will highlight in an, uh, another episode. But if you have any feedback, questions, whatever it might be, you can always email feedback at aftersight.org or call 720-712-8856. With that being said, I'm your host, Evan Starnes. This is Kelvin Crosby. Plug in your device. And we'll catch you guys next week.